mountain in Andalusia, Illinois. There is no mountain in Andalusia, Illinois. There's like this crevice that you ski down. Um, I'm from the mountains. And so I had in my mind that we were going to the mountains. <laughs> it turns out that Israel doesn't really have mountains either. Um, but they do have these very rolling hills. I, I would say what we were on was a big hill. Uh, I think Mount is generous. Uh, but this is what happened. Our tour guide, who is from Israel, went and got this guy. They had this side conversation. They, opened, they took us out of thousands of people. They took us to this gate that was about as wide as this podium. And they kind of did this. And then they opened the gate, and we went through this gate, and they locked the gate behind us, and then we went down this path to an amphitheater that overlooked the valley. And then we sat down, and, and the pastor who was leading us, his name was Pastor Mark, he said, I want you to hear the Sermon in the Mount the way you've never heard it before. And he had memorized the Sermon on the Mount. And so as we sat on the grass on this beautiful early February morning, it was about 60 degrees. I was a little chilled because I'm from the desert. He began to recite from memory the Sermon on the Mount. And as he said things like, consider the lilies of the field, you could look across and you could see the flowers blooming. Right? And as he said, consider the birds of the air Literally, we were watching birds fly over. I had never heard the Sermon on the Mount in its entirety. I'd read it, I'd studied it five or six verses at a time. My challenge for you, this is not the message, by the way. <laughs> My challenge for you, this week, we're going to have beautiful weather. Today, 79 degrees and 1% chance of rain. My challenge for you is sometime this week, Go outside, find a good Bible app, and listen in its entirety to chapter 5, 6, and 7. Hear the words of our Savior outside. It will change how you look at this message. It's beautiful. Now, last week, Pastor Scott set the table in an amazing way. Uh, he began to talk to us about what this message is. A and he began by telling us, and I have such respect for him, because he referenced both the Sixth Sense and Talladega Nights in his message. I don't know if you recognize that or not, but I was like cheering from my couch when I watched it on Monday morning. Um, he, he set the table for this idea that as Jesus was speaking, and remember, Jesus just walked out and sat down. It wasn't a big formal meeting. People didn't know months in advance it was going to happen. He just took the moment that he had, and he sat down, and he started to teach. And he's beginning to lay the concepts for this new kingdom. And what I want you to remember is this is the kingdom that will be, and it's the kingdom right now, right? Because if you know Jesus, and the Holy Spirit has entered your heart, we are celebrating the kingdom that will be in eternity and the kingdom that is. And Scott unpacked last week that in our kingdom, the kingdom of God, we operate under some different rules. There's some different normals. There are expectations for how we seek justice and for how we mourn and for how we love and for how we interact with each other. And that is where Jesus started, right? With this new context, because we are new in him, new life, new reality. So now today, we move on to the next part of chapter 5. Today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 through just 20. It's just seven short verses uh, so that's where we'll be today. If you want to pull out your Bible app on your phone, or if you're old school like me and have a paper Bible, um, my, my paper Bible, <laughs> this is my real Bible. I'll be honest with you. I have two. Well, I have more than two. I have my preaching Bible, my study Bible. I've had this since 1990. 
and I have my girlfriend Bible that I usually take out with me. Uh, this Bible, there are significant portions of the New Testament that are not actually attached anymore. Um, it's held together by packing tape. <laughs> You should never trust a pastor that has a brand new Bible. You just shouldn't, okay? <laughs> you just don't know. You just don't know. Uh, but I have just so many notes in this Bible, I couldn't leave it at home today. So you and me will both be gentle with it. Uh, let's just start in chapter 5 with verse 12 or 13. But first, let's pray, okay? Father God, we just thank you that you are here already. We thank you that you sent your son and that he has saved us um, from sin and from ourselves God, open our hearts and open our eyes anew to this teaching today. May every word that I speak be divine and from you. Um, we just praise you in advance for the work you will do in our heart in the moments ahead. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen. All right, so we're just going to start with verse 13, and I'm going to read for you seven verses. If you'd like, follow along or just listen. I didn't memorize it, I'll be honest, there was not enough time, okay? Um, it says... And this is Jesus speaking, remember. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not inherit the kingdom of heaven. All right. We're going to focus mostly on the first part of that teaching today, but I want to address verses 17 through 20 first. The last part of this teaching, Jesus says, don't think I've come to abolish the law. Jesus did not come to say the Old Testament wasn't relevant. Jesus was going to be unpacking in what we call chapters 5, 6, and 7, this radical new way of living out holiness in your daily life. And he didn't want people to misunderstand and think the other teaching wasn't relevant. What he wants us to understand is, and in addition to, right? He's saying, I need you to do more than know what this word says. I need you to let it penetrate your heart and change the way you live from here on out. See, the problem with the Pharisees and the teachers wasn't that they didn't know it, it was that they didn't live it and they didn't share it with the people around them. So as you are listening to the Sermon on the Mount later this week, because that's your homework, be keeping in mind, am I living this? Not just does my head hear it, but does my heart embrace it? Do my actions and my attitudes demonstrate it? Because Jesus wants us to get out of following the rules and get into the relational experience of life with him and life with each other. Nod your head if that makes sense. All right, some of you are following me. Some of you are like, I'm not sure. It's okay. Check it out. All right, so let's talk about the first part of this verse. The first part of this verse talks about salt, right? He says, you are the salt of the earth. If you're a paper Bible person, I'd love for you to circle or highlight in your app the word are. Not you will be, not you could be, 
If you are a follower of Jesus, you are right now, present tense, the salt of the earth. Now, why do we use salt? This is a question. It's not rhetorical. What are some things that we use salt for? Remember, I'm participating pastor. So one person, one way that we use salt. Seasoning. Anybody a salt lover on the food? Oh, me too. Seasoning. What else? Preservative. Yes. Anybody make beef jerky? Well, we do venison jerky, but it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's preservative. Any other ways we can use salt? Ice. Melts ice. Keeps us safe. Yeah. What else? It's in the ocean. I know. And do you find it weird that it's in the ocean and yet there's animals in the ocean that can live in salt? Our God is so creative. Right? Our God is so creative. Uh, Salt also can be used as a fertilizer. Did you know that? It's a fertilizer. Uh, In Bible days, they used to take handfuls of salt and mix it in with... um, the blessings that the cows and the mules would leave, right? <laughs> right. The excrement, that's a nice, lovely word, isn't it? Um, they would mix it together, the salt and the leftovers, and they would utilize it, they would use it to fertilize the fields. And in fact, fun fact, fertilizer that contains salt will produce a crop that is two three, or even four times larger than a crop without salt. That's pretty interesting. I didn't know that. Also, salt can be used to disinfect, to remove bacteria. Have you ever heard that saying, don't rub salt in the wound? Okay, weird. Now, if we say don't rub salt in the wound, it means don't make it worse. But for thousands of years, you know what they did to wounds? They put salt in them. Or they, or they would soak them in salt water because salt pulls out infection. And salt prevents bacteria. So salt has all kinds of uses. But you want to know something crazy about salt? It doesn't do anything by itself. Think about that for a second. Whether we're using salt as a preservative, or to add flavor, or to fertilize, or to disinfect, if the salt sits on the table, it does nothing. The only way that salt works is when it gets mixed in with the environment around us. Now, this is where it gets hard. We are the salt of the earth. If we are the salt of the earth, what do you think that means we're supposed to be doing? Mixing in, right? We're supposed to be mixing in. But sometimes, we, the salt of the earth, look at the stuff... We look at the fertilizer and we say, that's a pile of poo. I'm not going over there. (laughs) And we look at the infection and we say, that could be contagious. I'm not going over there. And, And we look at that thing that is bland and we say, we could add flavor to that situation, but that would require work. So I'm not going over there. See, sometimes us Jesus followers, me included, so sorry, Jamie, me included, we want to stay in our salt shaker because it's safe. It's not messy. I'm not going to get dirty. Nobody's going to get mad at me. I'm just going to stay in my salt shaker. But if you believe this, this says you are the salt of the earth. So there is the expectation that we're going to get in it that we're going to start to mix it up. Salt was not cheap back in Jesus' day. In fact, salt was such a commodity that people, Roman soldiers, they got paid with salt. 
Salt was known for enhancing and improving everything it touched. So when Jesus says, you are the salt, what he is saying is, we should be known for enhancing everything that we touch. So here's another hard question for us. Are we, as Jesus followers, known for that? Right? Because here's the thing about salt. If you put too much in, what happens? Have you ever had potatoes that had just a little bit too much salt? Right? So then that thing, (laughs) I see some judgment in the aisles right now. (laughs) So sorry. (laughs) Did not meet. You're going to be like, and that's when the fight started with that Pastor Tricia. Sorry. (laughs) Okay? Here's the deal. It's the right amount of salt. I'm going to tell you I love salt. My body craves salt. Did you know that salt has different flavors? I can tell what kind of eater you are. Because some of you are like, no, salt does not have flavors. And some of you are listing in your mind all the different salts you have in your shelf right now. Because you see, salt picks up flavors from the things it's mined with. So a pink salt literally has a different flavor than a black salt. The part of the world the salt comes from can impact the flavor that it has. Different types of salt have different types of purpose. As I look around this room today, I see all different kind of flavors of salt. That's exciting. God in his creativity knew that this world would need lots of different types of salt. Because here's the truth. The person that you're going to see on Tuesday is different than the person that you're going to see on Tuesday. And if we're not all effective salt in our environment, the world loses. Because then we're not doing our job. We're not mixing. We're not preserving. We're not flavoring. Yes, we're not fertilizing. We're not disinfecting. I came across some really interesting research uh, this last few weeks. It talked about how Christians can have a positive impact in their workforce. I hear a lot about people who work in a place where they're the only Jesus follower there, or there aren't very many. Does that sound familiar? You know anybody that works in an environment like that? Fun fact, if 5% of the workforce embraces a different culture, it will have a positive impact on the culture of the entire workforce. You need 5% to buy in. So if you work someplace where there's five employees and you're the only Christian, that's 20%, man. You're way over the 5% threshold. You can already be making a difference. See, a little bit of salt in the right amount goes a long way. Now let's talk about light. I love light. Uh, Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's from John 8. Jesus said, he's the light. Now, in this, this is confusing. This seems like it might be contradictory because right here it says in verse 14, you are the light. Again, You should circle that R, or you should highlight that R. It doesn't say you're going to be the light. It says you are the light. Right now, you follow in Jesus, you are the light. You are not the sun, (laughs) okay? There's one sun. His name was Jesus. You are more like the moon. Ooh, how many of you saw that funky little eclipse that we had a few weeks ago? Anybody see it? My staff was so excited about that. In fact, Matt uh, drug out for us a couple of welder's helmets, and so we could take the, and people were very confused as they drove by, all these women standing outside on the sidewalk with welder's gear on, so that we could look up, and this is what I did, I'll be honest, I walked out, I went, 
cool. And <laughs> like, I, I had staff members that they pretty much wanted to be out there the whole two hours just to see the whole thing. I, I saw it once, it was fine. Like, God's awesome. I can believe in God and believe in science. Okay? We're not the sun. When you think of you, think more like this. You're the moon. Because what does the moon do? It reflects the sun. And, and if you follow the moon pattern, sometimes the moon reflects the sun more, full moon. Sometimes the moon reflects the sun less, crescent moon, waning moon. There's a whole bunch more. I'm not a science person. I don't know. Okay, sometimes the moon doesn't reflect the sun at all. You are the light. We are called to reflect the true light. Jesus Christ. Amazing thing about light. If you have light, you do not have darkness. You can't. It, it doesn't matter if it's a little bit of light or if it's a lot of bit of light. If you have light, you cannot have darkness because it dispels light. When we went to this church in 2013, Rynaz sent a group of people to Guatemala. Do you remember that? Long time ago. And, and we had the opportunity to go on that trip. It was a Jesus film trip. We went to a, a teeny tiny little village in northern Guatemala. They had 110 homes. There were 1,200 people that lived in that village. Okay, think about that for a minute. 110 homes, 1,200 people that lived there. So the average was 11 people per home. The average home was about 300 square feet, okay? No electricity, none. When we had the opportunity to take in the Jesus film, we also took in a generator. And the church that we were helping to build was the only building in town that had light because we brought in a generator. And every night, people would come. And one night, it was so amazing. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. Matt and I were watching. We'd seen the Jesus film a few times. We were stand, it was standing room only. This church was packed. This church was probably, I don't know, half the size of this room, Matt. I mean, and it was, you couldn't, and it was the weirdest thing because it was open air. And when you walked into church, there was a guy standing at the front door selling frozen bananas that were dipped in chocolate. I'd never seen that before. I said to Pastor Berger, maybe we should try that. He was like, no. <laughs> no, we're not the, Randomly, dogs would run through. Like, at one point, this child was throwing grasshoppers on people. It was unlike any, any service I'd ever seen in my life. But Matt and I, we stepped to the back to give our seats to some of the locals who would come to see the Jesus film in their language, Okay? And we were standing at the edge of darkness. Okay, this is what I mean by that. In front of us was the light of the screen, and we could see the Jesus film. Behind us was utter blackness. There was no moon, blackness. And as we stood at the edge of darkness, we watched people step from darkness, literally, into light. We couldn't see him. We didn't know if they were a mile away or a foot away until they stepped into the light, right? And when they stepped into the light, they were in darkness no more. They could see. Jesus in this passage says, you are the light you are a city on a hill. I'm glad he didn't say a mountain because there are none. Okay? But from a long ways away, people can see you. Because if you're a, if you're a Jesus follower, you should be different. You should look different. You should talk different. You should treat your kids different. You should talk about your spouse different. Your attitude in a crappy work situation should be different because you're a light 
on a hill. And here's the thing. You don't know if the people who are searching for that light are a mile away or a minute away. Right? And see, we're not responsible for what they do. They can choose to stay in darkness. You know what's scary about the light? You can see stuff. You can see stuff. I just, I just changed the light bulbs in the bathroom yesterday, Zach's bathroom. <laughs> and and he, he, I thought he wouldn't know. It turns out he did. Um, because the old light bulbs were like the soft white light bulbs, you know, the ones that barely show you anything at all. I replaced them all with the daylight, 70 waters. There's four of them. He said he walked into the bathroom and thought he had entered the interrogation room. (laughs) He's like, well, but you can see, right? Man, the light doesn't let us hide from our imperfections. Right? The light doesn't allow us to make excuses for those things we've been pretending not to see. We are called to be the light. Maybe not the interrogator's light. Maybe a soft light. Maybe a candlelight. Maybe some days you burn brighter than other days. My question today is this. How well are you reflecting the light? Because see, the moon only reflects the sun well when it's in the right position. If the moon gets out of position, it begins to wane. It begins to fade. Can't see the light as well. So if you have a fading light, my sister or my brother, I need you to come back to center. I need you to come back to where you can be in the presence of the true son, the son of God, the son of man. That's how he described himself, right? The God who walked among us as one of us. Come back to him. Because what our community, what our country, what our family, what our friends, what our co-workers need right now are people who will circle the R's in this statement. I am salt. I am light. I bring value. Because I am a Jesus follower And Jesus' followers are meant to improve every situation they go in. I don't know what your situation is today. Like some of you I know and I've known for a while. Some of you I just met for the first time. I don't know what your situation is today. I'm not looking to throw stones. I'm looking to throw questions. Right? Do you love Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Are you a Jesus follower? If you're not a Jesus follower, man, I'd love to talk to you about that because there's a God who knows you and loves you and wants to be in relationship with you right now, wherever you are. And you don't have to clean up. You don't have to fix anything. You just come as you are, and he's already there and ready to meet you. If you are a Jesus follower, then I just got to ask you with great love, are you salty? I told Matt the other day, young Trish Wilson, you know the girl you met in 2001? She would have showed up today in a t-shirt that said, are you salty? Are you lit? (laughs) That has a very different meaning now. (laughs) Right? Are you salty? Is your light shining? Because if you love Jesus, this is who you've been called to be. There's the rule of the 1%. This can be very overwhelming. I am a girl. I'll be honest with you. I don't believe in New Year's resolutions because they don't last. But I like to make New Year's goals. Okay? Because goals you can just keep working towards even if you fail a little bit. My goal for this year, honestly, my goal was to suck at new things. Now think about that for a minute. I want to not be good at new things, which means I'm willing to try some new things. In general, I don't like to try things I'm not good at. 
We, in an effort to do this, bought pickleball equipment. Are you all familiar with pickleball? Yeah, okay, I'll be honest, it's still in the box. <laughs> okay, and there's a really good chance that the girl who has poor hand-eye coordination isn't going to be the best at pickleball. I told Matt, I feel like I'd do better if I could buy a new outfit first. And he said, I feel like we should get it out of the box. <laughs> Okay, the law of 1% says you don't have to be perfect. The law of 1% says if I can do it for a year, okay, for a year, if every day I try and do 1% better today than I did yesterday, just 1% better, today I'm going to do two sit-ups instead of just the one. Okay, if I can improve by 1% a day, in a year, I will have improved by more than 37%. Okay? The law of 1%. So I'm not saying to you, if you're not the salt and you're not the light, then here's 27 things that you need to do different. This is what I'm saying to you. What can you do 1% better tomorrow? Do you think you could handle 1%? Nod your head if you could handle 1%. Some of you are like, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's okay. Because you know what? We can be bad at new things together. Jesus doesn't say, come to me, those of you who are perfect and have it all figured out, and you can be on my team. That's not what he says. He says, come to me, you who are worn out, tired, heavy laden, right? If you're carrying burdens that are not your own, you come to me and I will give you rest. The 1% law. The Sermon on the Mount is going to challenge you this summer if you let it. Because everything else that we talk about from here on out is rooted in these two things that Christ started with. Understanding in the new kingdom, there's new rules and understanding that you are right now walking under a different identity, under a different responsibility. You are right now salt and light. And that's going to change every attitude, every action, every behavior, every preference, every perspective. It's going to challenge everything you ever thought you ever knew, and it's going to call you to this other Christ-like thing. And don't you dare be like the Pharisees. Let it penetrate your heart. Let it change you. Let it transform you. Let it shape you into God's precious son or daughter. Cool? Cool. So here's your homework. This week, Beautiful weather. I checked the weather app right before I walked in. This week, take it's going to take you about 25 minutes. Okay? Grab a glass of iced tea. Iced tea's good. Or Mountain Dew, I guess, would work. Um, I don't drink Mountain Dew. but <laughs> And go sit outside and hear the birds and listen to the sermon and let it penetrate your heart. Can I pray blessing over you before we leave?